The average person speaks about 7,000 words a day, give or take, average. Some of you probably do more than that. Some of you do less than that. Uh, I guess I read somewhere some, some use up, up to 20,000 words a day. I don't know if you live with someone that uses 20,000 words a day, but you might. Uh, we won't name any names this morning, but there are people who like, who like to use words, right? On a daily basis, if you captured all of your words, if you're the 7,000 word person, it would be about a 50 page book every day. Now, that's not a big book, but 50 pages a day. If you're putting a book over a lifetime, if you did that, you'd fill all 32 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. You ever see those babies? Every volume's like this thick. So you're stacking them up 32 high over the course of your life. One of the truths that we know from the Bible is that our speech, that is the words we use, have power. That's how God designed us. Our tongues can be used to bless others or to tear others down. Uh, James chapter 3, verse 9, James says, With it, our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, he said, these things ought not to be so. Verse 10. Here's the thing. You can tell a lot about a person by what they speak. If you're paying attention to the words that people around you use, you, can, you can't tell everything by the words, but you can tell a lot. It gives you a picture. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's in our hearts, what overflows out of our hearts comes out of our mouths, our lips, our tongues, right? Of course, here we are on the doorstep of a, another election. I think it's probably the fourth or fifth in a row that has been entitled the most important election of our lifetime. Have you heard that? So for four, we're going back now, more than a dozen years, this is the most important election ever. And they all keep rolling that way, right? And there have been a lot of words used. And many of them, and I'll say this, on both sides of the aisle, from both political parties, from both candidates, from candidates all around, because it's not just a national election, it's also state and local. There's a lot of people being on the ballot here this week. And, and, and many of those words are not pretty. And what we are seeing, uh, to a certain degree, it's always been true of political process in this nation. I'm actually, I had a political science minor in college, little known fact. And so I have studied the political process in college and on, we're interested in it. But the, the, and here's the thing. What we're seeing is that the ideals and the policy positions that, which are worth debating, by the way, they are worth debating, are so often overshadowed by incendiary language. If you look up incendiary, it is tending to arouse strife, sedition, inflammatory, catch things on fire. That's the kind of words that are often used in the political arena. And the truth is, politics can get ugly. And the meanness of it can expose what's in our hearts. What did Jesus say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when we use words, especially around this kind of, you know, what we're dealing with in, in the political realm, it can be exposing. So this summer, as I began to pray about this series, knowing we were headed to look at wisdom all fall long, uh, eight weeks here, it seemed fitting to come to the doorstep of the election and be reminded of the timely words from Paul's pen, the Spirit's prompting. So if you have your Bible, Colossians chapter 4, is where we're headed this morning. Just a few verses, um, verses 2 through 6 this morning in the book of Colossians. We're wrapping up our wisdom series today, and it's fitting these words from Paul. And so if you can find your 
Ephesians, Philippians, GE Power Company, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. Paul says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Verse 5, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. I love that phrase, walk in wisdom. Live with wisdom. When the Bible talks about walking, it's your manner of life. It's how you live. It's your every day. How you, how you move through life. Move through life with wisdom. Whatever situation you encounter, whatever arena you're in, whatever, whatever area of life God has you, walk in wisdom. And you notice there, it says, especially toward outsiders. And just clue, that's not the people from the other political party. The outsiders here refers to those who are outside of the family of God, those who are not yet in Christ, who have not yet received his salvation, are not in relationship with him outside. The other phrase there is making the best use of the time. Literally, in the Greek, it it says, buy up the opportunity. I like that. Seize the opportunities. Purchase the opportunities. Take the everyday opportunities God gives you and invest in them for what? Invest in them for eternity, for the things of God, for the ways of God, for the truth of the gospel. Purchase the opportunities. Buy up the Make the most of the time. Uh, I love Skip Isaac. He says, Paul was a spiritual opportunist. He was always looking for an opportunity to advance the gospel, to move the ball down the field. What was the ball? The message of Jesus Christ and him crucified, what he's been talking about and declaring the whole way. You notice the passage, this passage is not about politics or elections. It is about how we live out the mission of God in the world, how we pray, how we live, how we speak, in ways that lead people to knowing Christ. I was reading an article earlier this week from David Mathis, and I want to read part of it to you. He says this, Jesus' mission is bigger than next Tuesday's election. Way bigger. The Great Commission summons to make disciples, both reaching out for more and going deep for more. And it relativizes the stock that Jesus' followers put in any political endeavor. Christians are not to be dead set on winning elections, but on making disciples. We put our best eggs in the disciple-making basket, not the ballot box. We aren't surprised by defeat in the short run, but bank on triumph in the long haul. Lose the election, win the world. The Christian's trust is not in politics. Our hope for the future is not in the incumbent or the challenger but in the God-man who promises that he will build his church and that his gospel will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And his final instructions before taking to the air did not include a word about the necessity of political activism, but focused clearly and concisely on making disciples. Christian, he says, we have bigger fish to fry. It can be easier to keep a Great Commission perspective on life and ministry when we're not in the midst of an election cycle. But as that first Tuesday of November approaches, we're hit week after week, day after day, with successive waves of news and conversation and cross-media political ads that would have us suddenly forget where our true hope lies and what the real mission is. If you're not yet frustrated by the epic proportions of spin and sidestepping, you may be hiding in a hobbit hole. If you're confused by all the rhetoric and slant, you're in good company. 
Disappointed with all the name-calling and mudslinging? Welcome to the club. There are good Christian reasons for being dis disillusioned all over again with this year's campaign, but utter despair is a pitfall the Christian gospel would have us avoid. Perhaps more dangerous than disillusionment, though, is the deception, even among Christians, that politics really can give us the fixes that we need. That an improved government, whether bigger or smaller, pick your preference, can heal what's profoundly wrong with the human race and recoup what's gone terribly askew in our hearts. Human government emphatically cannot provide the final cure, but at best is God's common kindness toward us for holding a few good things in place while we wait for the conquest of the perfect leader through disciple-making. Human government is from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God, Romans 13. Yes, we should be deeply thankful if we live in a federal constitutional republic, massively grateful for the blood that has been spilled to found it and preserve it, and profoundly appreciative that our lot is not tyranny or worse, anarchy. The government is God's servant for your good. Now, it's interesting because that um, article was written 12 years ago. It could have been written last week. Sounds like it. If you're just sitting there going, oh, wow, it was written 2012. Now, don't mishear what I'm saying this morning. We need to vote as citizens of this nation. And we need to engage in the process at whatever level God leads us. And we need to seek to uphold our God-given freedoms and the values we cherish as Christ's followers. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. But part of our wisdom is recognizing the limits of politics and the limits of political solutions. Because here's the thing, hearts are not changed by the political process. Only Jesus Christ has the power and authority to transform human beings in ways that are life-changing, eternity-altering, and ultimately impact the world around us in ways that honor God. How does it happen? Through Christ. How do we do that? Through Christ. How's it going to be accomplished? Through Christ. Go vote. Do your part. Pray. And we're going to do that later this morning. Pray. Absolutely. Absolutely. Engage where God leads you, but know the limits. Know where it can take you and where the ceiling is for political solutions. Because in our country, we have come to the point where the tenor is, it's all politics all the time. And the only thing is politics and winning the election. And so that becomes like, wow, like it can make us disoriented to the truth about what our, because guess what's going to happen Wednesday morning? Whoever, we, and we might not even know who wins Tuesday night, probably, probably won't, but we're going to get Wednesday morning, and we're going to love people, and we're going to make disciples. We're going, to, we're going to build into our kids. We're going to raise our families. We're going to go to work. We're going to do our job faithfully. We're going, to, we're going to serve one another in this community. We're going to do all the things we've been doing for all these years. And so Wednesday morning is going to come, and we're going to be at the post and doing what God's called us to do as his people. And so that's a vital word this morning. So how does this whole thing happens in terms of how Paul lays out. A couple things here. Uh, number one, this involved, the, the mission of God involves persistent prayer on your outline this morning. What does Paul say? He says, continue in it steadfastly. Be watchful. Be alert. Be vigilant in prayer. Too many times when it comes to prayer, we get stuck in a couple of mindsets. One of those mindsets is emergency use only. So you, you see those signs? In case of emergency, break glass. A lot of times that's how our mindset is with prayer. I just, I, I pray when the heat is up, the fire is raging around me. When there's a crisis, when there's a health scare, when there's a meltdown, when finances are tight, when the, when the kids are going all over the place and we're having a hard time as a family or, or when I lose a job or, when, you know, fill in the blank. And so we kind of break the glass and God, can you, God, will you, God, could you, God? And so we kind of reserve prayer. Sometimes so our thinking becomes emergency use only. Then there's the other part of this mindset with prayer. It becomes, we get, into, we get stuck in devotional neutral where it's easy to drift and we get distracted. 
and the phone goes off. And you ever have some time when you're trying to get some quiet time with God and you're like trying to get in your zone and, and focus and then a kid, kid comes to the, in, through the kitchen or a phone goes off or something happens that you got called away or someone shows up or a plane flies over or what, what you know, all these things happen and we get distracted. Our minds just flow into all sorts of places. It's called devotional neutral. And so sometimes in prayer, we get stuck there. It is interesting. We talk a lot about the power of prayer. And in theory, we believe in the power of prayer. But George Barna, who has done polls for decades now on Christian living and the church and behaviors of Christians, Barna found that the average Christian prays one minute or less on a daily basis. A minute. A minute. So we talk about the importance of prayer and the power of prayer and the need for prayer and pray, pray. But if you do all the math and actually talk to people who pray or who don't pray, it works out to about a minute a day or less. Average. Remember, Paul is writing this letter also from prison. Colossians is one of the prison epistles. Philippians is a prison epistle as well. There are, I think, four of them. Ephesians is one. And he and his fellow uh, frontline operators, stormtroopers, Timothy, Aristarchus, Epaphras, they are in the battle together. They are seeking by the power of the Holy Spirit to recapture the hearts of men for God. And they made a strike at the enemy line and encountered a tremendous opposition. Satan came against them, and so now they're in prison. And Paul is reaching out to the Colossians, and he says to them, pray. He says, stay at it. Be diligent. Be steadfast. Call command headquarters. This is a war we're in. Call command headquarters and have them fire a missile that will blast open a door in the prison wall. And here's the thing, not for me to get out, but for the gospel to get out. He never says, pray for me to be released. He says, pray for a door to be open, for the word, for the message of God. That's really profound. Specific prayer, open up a door for the gospel to get out. And isn't it interesting? It's amazing. For two years, we know Paul was in prison at different times his life, but he was in prison at one stretch for two years under house arrest in Rome. And the Bible says, if you go to the very, I'm not going to turn there now, but if you go to the very end of Acts, Acts chapter 28, the last two verses of the book of Acts, verses 30 and 31, Acts 28, the Bible says, he, Paul, welcomed all who came to him while he was in prison, chained to a guard, proclaiming the kingdom of God, and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So there was, Paul was able in that situation to receive visitors. And everybody that came got the gospel. And everybody that left, left with the gospel. So here they come, here they go. Here they come, here they go. Here they come, here they go. And he was proclaiming Christ, teaching them, declaring the truth about God. And so everybody that came left with more of the gospel and more to share. And the gospel went, and all those, those, pity, those poor guards that were chained to him, right? Like they were a captive audience. Like they listened to it all day long. I wonder how many of them took it back to their families or their homes or their, their, their fellow soldiers. And the gospel went out with them. Mm, love that. All who came to him. Don't miss this. And Skip Isaac said it well. He said, Paul's confinement was his assignment. And he, again, was not praying for his release, but for an open door. And so for you as well, I want to encourage you this morning. When life feels restrictive to you, when you feel like you might be in some sort of, I'll use the word in quotes, prison, it may be a job that you're struggling in, it may be physical limitations that you have where your body's not what it was or you went through an illness or, and so you feel restrictive in, physically, in physical ways. It might even be a marriage where you feel like you're confined in a marriage that's not going where you had hoped. 
And so the, the, the thing there is, Lord, show me an open door, not for me to get out, but for the gospel to go out, for God's word to go out, for God's truth to go out, for the gospel to go out. Whatever I'm stuck in, Lord, this, this confinement that I'm in is actually your assignment. You've got me here for a reason. And there's a season and there's a purpose to live out and extend the gospel. So the question for you and for me, is the gospel still being released even through your prison, whatever that means for you in your life? A final word on prayer here. Paul says, pray with thanksgiving. Now, 32 times in his letters, he mentions the word with thanksgiving or give thanks or thankfully. So thanksgiving is a big deal to Paul. 32 times in his letters, that phrase comes up. And thanksgiving, part of our thanksgiving, as we're moving towards that season even on the calendar, part of our thanksgiving is remembering what God has done. Right? And part of that is keeping your eyes on the victory of God. I was thinking about that this week. You think about Jesus and the things he endured and his battles with Satan. Think about the victory every step along the way. So Jesus versus Satan in the wilderness when he's just getting started his public ministry and 40 days and 40 nights and then Satan comes and who wins that? Jesus wins that battle. And then you think about Jesus and Satan all the way through, but later on in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is praying for the cup to be taken, but yet your will, Father, your will, not mine, Father, who wins? Jesus, as Satan is tempting him to, again, get out of this thing, Jesus stays the course, he wins. Jesus first, Satan on the cross. There he is, the Son of Man, Son of God, hanging on a tree, bleeding, dying. Satan thinks he has the victory, but the tables are actually turned on him because this is the way that God pays for our sin. This is the way that God deals with our sin, and it happens through the victory that Jesus experiences on the cross. And then Jesus and Satan in the resurrection because when he thinks he has him down and he thinks he's dead and he thinks he's gone, on the third day, the Bible says what? He rose again from the dead, conquering sin and death. And so all along the way, victory, 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 victory. Trace it yourself. That's the story of the gospel. It's a victory. And so our prayer, our thanksgiving, is recognizing and being thankful for what God has already done the victory he's already accomplished, and what he has promised. And what has he promised? To lead us to victory. Part of your inheritance, part of my inheritance as the follow of Christ is victory, ultimate triumph. He leads us in triumphal procession. Like when they used to do the Romans, they used to bring in the, the, the vanquished foes and they bring them into town and they had their chains and they basically drug them through town and had a parade and the generals at the head with the stallion and the sword and the shield and the helmet and we have conquered. And this is the image that Paul thinks when he thinks of Jesus Christ. This is the victory parade and we're in the parade. We have been able by his power to accomplish the victory over sin and death through his ultimate cross and resurrection, his death and resurrection. Hallelujah. So when you're thinking about prayer and you're talking about how do I engage in prayer, be specific. Lord, give me an open door. Show me an open door. Lord, create an open door for your word and your message to go out from my life. Whatever situation I'm in, I want it to go out from me. And also, God, I want to pray in a spirit of thanksgiving because I know what you've done. And I know the victory you've won, and I know the victory that is still to come. And so that gives us great encouragement as we think about prayer and the mission of God. And then secondly, this morning, and I'm going to combine these together, it is living with wise behavior and wise words. Part of wise living, verses 5 and 6 there, part of wise living is knowing that the outside world is watching. And so as Christians, you oftentimes feel like, hey, we feel like, well, I'm kind of in the fishbowl. And, and I know some of you feel that. You know, you're in, you're in environments where you are different, 
where you might be the one standing out. You might be the one moving in that direction. Everybody else is moving in this direction. Everybody else believes this. You believe that. And so you sometimes feel like, hey, it's, it, it's definitely a challenge. It's definitely hard living in this world and this political uh, time frame that we're living in, this season of politics and elections. Wow, it's, there's a lot going on, right? A lot, of, a lot of craziness. But knowing that the outside world is watching, part of living wisely is trusting God to help you know what to do for his glory, how to redeem the time, Paul says, looking for opportunities to show the world how real your faith is. So I don't just talk about the reality of God. I don't just talk about the reality of Jesus Christ, but I live out what I believe. And I do that when an election comes and I'm still living out of my convictions about who God is and what his word says when, 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 we're, when we're surrounded by this, all this milieu of election stuff. Or when I'm facing trials in my life, and we all face them. When I'm facing a trial, I don't just talk about God. I live it out. Where the things that I say I believe, I walk them out. Even when it's hard, even when the fire's up, even when the heat is high, even when the pain is real, even when the, diffi- when the difficult days come and I don't want to get out of bed, but God, help me to get out of bed. Help me to give you glory today. Help me to walk today. Help me to move today. Help me to trust you today. And I keep moving. I keep moving because this is the reality that all of us as believers face. And, and so at work, I do the same thing at work. Wherever I work, I'm going to be consistent with what I say and how I live. In my community, when I'm moving around the community and I'm coaching soccer or baseball or I'm at the school event or the play or the drama or the theater or wherever wherever I'm at, I am consistently, this is what I believe, this is what I say, this is how I live. And certainly, I would say, in our homes, probably first in our homes with our families, that there's a consistency of this is what I believe, this is what I say, and this is how I live. Wise living. Trusting God to show me how to do that. It is knowing also how to become all things to all people without compromising. Wise living. Still living out holiness and truth right alongside love and compassion. See, they actually go together. I want to be honoring God and there are convictions and things that I believe strongly in that, that the, the, the issues that I would say of, of holiness and morality and, and truth, and I want to walk in that. But at the same time, I want, to, I want to model for people what love and compassion looks like. So Holy Spirit, show me how to do that. I want to live in a way that helps people know you. I don't want to push people from you. I want people to know you. So Lord, help me to, to stay true and to stay walking in that path of love and compassion at the same time. That's a work of the Spirit in our lives as His people. It is having a sense for the moment and an eye for what people need. Discernment. Not just your platform. I made that note early this morning as I was going through this outline again this morning early. That was a phrase I didn't have in this week. Put it in this morning. Because sometimes we get a, a platform that we feel really strongly about and we're just bang, 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 bang. And everybody we see, bang, bang. And we've got our thing. But, but realizing, no, what is needed as I'm in relationship with this person, I'm having an engagement with this person, what do they need to be able to know God even more, to understand him more completely, more fully, even in this moment? What can I say that will help them versus what do I need to, how do I need to get my platform out? It's a very different way. Alistair Begg says, every Christian has a responsibility to live in such a way as to point people to the beauty, power, and sufficiency of Christ. I love that phrasing. The beauty, power, and sufficiency of Christ. All of us. Paul does that in his preaching, in his proclamation. He says, pray for me. Pray for me. I want to make this word as clear as I can. This is what I need to, I need to make this gospel clear. Pray for me to do that. But he also encourages all the believers who are part of the church at Colossae and us 
You've got a role to play in getting out the gospel. Your lifestyle matters. You practice what you pray, and you practice what you proclaim. Walk in wisdom, he says, and also let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Our words should strike a balance. And so we, we, we are called to use gracious words, words that are kind, words that are respectful, words that are courteous, but at the same time, salt, words that are true, words that are right, words that are pure, words that are convicting. We're, we're using words that challenge where it's needed. And so that's part of our role as believers in the world. And Pastor Chuck's going to talk more about that next week, our role as salt in the world. But our words should be both gracious and salty in terms of where, because when you rub salt into things, uh, if they had a wound, you rub salt into it, it burned a little bit. Ah! But what did it do? It healed. It healed. And so there's something about salt that has an a, a effect of healing, preserving, binding up. And so those words on both sides. Wisdom to say the right thing at the right time. And that's where we need the Holy Spirit. Because in our flesh, we want to just bring it. God, help me to, to, to speak in ways that are gracious and also with the right amount of salt. And that's something that the Holy Spirit has to show us. I, I love this illustration as we, as we close here this morning. Um, there's, a, there's a species of crane in the southern part of Turkey, and it's the Taurus Mountains. And it's an indigenous species to that area. It's a crane that is known for its cackling. So as it flies, it kind of cackles. It cackles this horrible kind of cackle while it flies. Well, because it cackles while it flies, it attracts the attention of the black eagle, which is also a part of that ecosystem. And the black eagle is a predator. And the cackling is like, come and eat lunch. Like that crane is just doing its thing, and it's basically just say, hey, come, come on, it's lunchtime, right? So it's like an invitation. So if that crane is cackling, the eagle will hear it, swoop down, and eat it. So get this, experienced cranes in that area avoid this by picking up stones large enough to fill their mouth. Wow. To prevent them from cackling. It's like, he said, I, I know I have the urge to do it, but I, if I put a rock in my mouth, then I won't say that thing. I won't, you know, I'm tempted to say that thing, but if I just had a big enough rock in my mouth, that's pretty brilliant. It was this, it's as if these cranes know the truth of Proverbs 18.21, which says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And so they have learned the right use of their mouth can mean the difference between survival or demise, life or death, the power of the tongue. So I, 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 my prayer today is that as we think about interacting with people, and I know you have been, and here we are Tuesday, we're going to go vote, and there's a lot of conversations happening Lord, help us to, to live wisely and to speak wisely. Help us to do both. And help us to know that the mission, your mission is way greater, way more than what happens on Tuesday. What happens on Tuesday is important. I'm not minimizing it. I'm saying there's more important. There's a higher thing. It's God's kingdom and the work he's called us to, the mission he's called us to. So I want to encourage you right now, we're going to just take a few minutes, why don't you hit your knees, because this is one of those Sundays where I feel like we want to continue to be faithful to pray for our, so hit, let's, let's close our time together in a few minutes of prayer. As if you're able to, get on your knees. If not, that's fine, sit in your pew. But let's just pray for what is happening in our land and our nation as we close this time together and for what's coming. God, you are awesome. You are worthy. And there is none like you. There is no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth who is as great as you. There is no one who is perfect in every way but you. You are holy and true, righteous, pure. 
And so we honor you right now on our knees, declaring that you are the great God of heaven and the God of earth, and that you sit on the throne and you are the ruler and you are the king. You're the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And so we're going to elect a leader this week in our nation. And our prayer is that you, as the king of kings, would help us, that you would guide us as a people, your people. And so we, we know, Lord, that these decisions are often very challenging in terms of there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of uh, critical spirits, a lot of kind of, well, there's a lot of falsehoods, a lot of lies that are bandied about, a lot of things that are said that probably shouldn't be said. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us as your people to walk in wisdom as we head to the polls on Tuesday, as we go about our business on Wednesday, as we love people and serve people and help this community and disciple our kids and our teens and raise our families and go to work and all the things that you've called us to do. Lord, help us to do that in a way that brings you honor. And we're trusting you for the outcome of Tuesday. We don't know where it's headed. We know it's going to be a hard-fought election. And so we pray that you give us the wisdom, all of us, as we pray about entering that election booth and who we are to vote for. Lord, guide us. Lord, lead us out of the conviction of our hearts and the conscience that you've given us and the, the work of the Holy Spirit. We want to pray that you'd triumph. Ultimately, it's not about who sits in the White House, but who sits in heaven. It's not who lives on Pennsylvania Avenue, but who lives in, in where the streets are gold and the sea is crystal. And forevermore, heaven, you reign, you reign, you reign. And so we worship you and pray that you would guide us as a people. I pray that our church would be a, a, a group of people that are faithful, that we are a group of people that are wise, that we are a group of people that are filled with love for our community and for this region, that you would help us to, to model the heart of Christ always. And that in conversations with people, when there's tough things that come up, political things that come up, help us to know what to say. Help us to know how to say it. Help us to know when to say it. And we ask for that. We, we trust you for that. And we pray that beyond all these things, that the, the message of Christ would go forth in power that the gospel would go forth in, in boldness and that people would know that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord of our lives, Lord of this church, and that we serve one king. And so we pray that you'd help us to put all that into perspective as we spend our time this week working together as a body, voting, and being part of this great country that you've given us, doing our part. And we ask for your wisdom and leading in all of it. And we pray it in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Providence Church Podcast. For more, visit us online at provchurch.net. Wherever you are, be sure to make it a great day.